I think I ought to clarify this terminology. When I say existential risks, I don't mean the risks posed to us by existentialists. <laughs> uh, as threatening as they may be, the risks I'm talking about are much more dire. So quick poll. How many of you want this to happen? <laughs> uh, there's some days when you feel like, you know... <laughs> yeah. So existential risk is the risk to our very existence. And when I say our, I don't mean me. I don't mean me and you. I don't mean everyone in this room. I don't even mean Australia. I mean the entire global civilization that comprises humanity. The existence of all of our potential technology, institutions, etc., etc. Up in smoke. So I believe that this would be a very bad thing. And perhaps that's obvious, but sometimes we don't act like it. So, the thing is, this is dramatic, but it's unlikely. It's got about, say, a 5% probability. And, you know, that's rather scary. <laughs> Um, so some, pe some people disagree with my figure. I don't believe it's certain, which is why I'm giving this talk. So why do we, in my view, behave weirdly about this? Well, do we care about the future? Should we care about the future? I know one class of people who does, the people who I owe money to. <laughs> They want prompt repayment, and you can't repay your bills when the world is blown up. Uh, more generally, people who have a lot to gain in the future kind of care about preserving the future. And as a corollary, people who don't have a lot to gain in the future, such as, say, politicians who are kind of lame duck politicians. Julia Gillard arguably did not have a lot to gain in 2014. Uh, and you know, CEOs perhaps don't have a lot to gain either because either they do well this quarter, who cares what happens five years from now? You know, this quarter is very important. And you know, or they do badly and they get fired and no one cares about them anymore. So creditors care, politicians and businesses don't. Another class of people who care are, well, were monarchs. You know, if you want to make a great future for your descendants, then there is good reason to care about that future. More generally, we have this phenomenon called dynamic inconsistency. I'll give you an example. When I'm studying maths, and it's a day before the exam, I would pay $100 to have another day of study. Hell, I'd pay $1,000 sometimes. But if you ask me at the beginning of term, Patrick, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Give me $100 now and we'll postpone your exam for a day. Would I take that bet? Well, I wouldn't. Uh, because I don't care about the future. At least I <laughs> Or at least I don't care about my future self five minutes before I've gotten a stressful exam. My future self does that. And maybe we should take his opinions into account. And, you know, part of the reason that we, you know, we have this kind of ambivalence about the future is that it's uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, determinism, sure. Even if you are a determinist, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the, Rules of physics could spin like clockwork, and you simply don't have the computational power to predict accurately. 
So the case for reducing existential risk. Imagine that this is society's happiness over time. Or if you don't care about happiness, imagine these smiley faces are something that you do care about, like, uh, I don't know, what's something people care about these days? iPads? <laughs> yeah, imagine these are the total number of iPads over time. So, this is the scenario when there's no existential risk. This is humanity living up to its potential. This is what happens when there's an existential risk. Imagine that we have this amount of joy, and suddenly that joy, or iPads, or whatever, drops to zero and stays there. And all this potential, and you know, really, this time axis should extend over here, perhaps. All that potential is wasted, squandered. And that's why you should care about existential risk, because 90% of the U's are going to be in the future. Or 99% of the U's, you can say. So existential risks kill most smiley faces, and I'm, I like smiley faces, therefore I want to prevent existential risk. This is a consequentialist argument. It's an argument based on the consequences. Now, I think most people do believe morality is kind of determined by the consequences of your actions. But, you know, to cover my bases here, uh, if you believe that morality is about following the rules, well, we have a rule against genocide, which I believe is fairly universally agreed upon, and I think that destroying all of humanity would count on that score. And, you know, some people think that Morality is about being virtuous. I'd like to point out that prudence is a virtue. <laughs> so, I want to distinguish here between existential risk and global catastrophic risk. This might be something like a war, or a disease that kills, say, one-fifth of the population. You know, we get a huge bloody, you know, we get a huge hit in our happiness, but we recover. And that's why, perhaps, I mean, this is still a massive thing, this is still a massive hit, but I can't bring myself to care one, about a 1% 1 probability of this the same way I can bring myself to care about a 1% probability of this, because these numbers are much, much bigger, because we're talking about all of time, all of humanity's lifetime here. So, existential risks. Well, the first existential risk that I think we really knew about was global thermonuclear war. These are three scientists standing next to a picture of the doomsday clock the number of minutes till midnight was their estimated probability of full-scale nuclear war erupting. The closer that minute hand to midnight, the more likely the chance. I think that the closest it came was two minutes to midnight, although arguably there was an event which should have brought us to one minute to midnight, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where I think Kennedy estimated about a 33% probability that game's over, we're pushing the button. And you know, I wonder how, how close to midnight that would be, you know, maybe a minute, 30 seconds. But we carried on. Now, nuclear war in the present is still an existential risk. The US has about 10,000 nuclear missiles, so Russia has about 15,000. There are rogue nations trying to build their own nuclear weapons program, North Korea and Iran, most notably. Um, and at present, this doomsday plot is set 
at five minutes to midnight. So, I mean, interestingly though, I think we reacted in the right kind of way to this risk. We knew the states. Um, these people went to the trouble of building a clock. <laughs> you know, in, in a way, nuclear war was kind of the, one of the first ways in which our intelligence could permanently wipe us out. Our intelligence could be used against us in such a dramatic way. So this is when someone else's intelligence is used against us in a dramatic way. The risk of AI. So this is a friendly little picture. What possible harm could he do to us? And I'm worried I'm going to tread on Kevin's toes here. Um, so there's a lot of talk about the technological singularity. You know, that we have smarter than human AIs who can predict our every move the same way that we can predict an ant's. Uh, you know, I remember uh, someone telling me that the most unrealistic thing about the movie Terminator was that there were surviving humans. So that's the worst case scenario, unfriendly, super intelligent AI. <coughs> suppose, it's at in, suppose it's at human intelligence and it's unfriendly. Well, then we're just back to our old old friend of thermonuclear war, aren't we? Or, you know, any kind of war. With an enemy that can kind of reproduce itself at will. Even if it can't outthink us, it might outmanufacture us. But, you know, these scenarios always seem to me to have an element of science fiction to them. You know, smarter than human machines. I mean, we can make arguments that are plausible, we can draw exponential looking graphs. But take dumber than human machines, take the amount of trust that you put in your machines right now. What would happen, for instance, if all the electricity went out in Australia for two months? Well, the stock market would crash. Planes wouldn't know where to land. Hospitals would lose their life. You know, imagine, imagine you're performing a delicate operation and suddenly the lights go out. Telephones go out of work. Business crawls to a halt. The government is unable to communicate with its citizens because some of us live in the web. We don't have a phone, we just have an internet connection. And even if we had a phone, we couldn't use it. So think about all that. That's the amount of trust we put in our machines. And we're putting more trust into our machines. Our machines not only uh, produce our goods, they not only produce our food, but we're letting them into our personal lives, aren't we? You know, I use Facebook. I let machines sort through my emails and decide which ones I should read. I let machines uh, tell me, you know, how many push-ups I should do. And the worry, the worry isn't that these tools will develop a consciousness and work maliciously against us. The issue is kind of more subtle. The issue is what the machine does and what we want it to do can diverge. And they can be in misalignment for the most, in, for the most innocent of reasons. I've done a little bit of uh, study in AI and a kind of problem that we assume away is what counts as good. We assume that we have an objective computable performance measure. Now, do any of you have an objective computable performance measure? Can you tell me at this moment, as a number, 
how good this experience is. Well, from 1 to 10. <laughs> right, from 1 to 10. Um, but could you give me, uh, could you, I mean, that's meaningless, isn't it? There's more to life than a number. But there's not more to this guy's life than a number. He wants to maximize his score. He wants to maximize his score because we programmed him to. We programmed him to because it's very easy to develop programs that maximize a score. And that's kind of the risk of AI. A divergence in values. Whereas before, what the aspect of our intelligence that threatened us was our technical genius, our ability to build machines that had explosive results, literally. And perhaps our strategic genius saved us or imperiled us, depending on your point of view. But, you know, physics and military strategy are both kind of objective. They're kind of simple in a way. I, I could program an AI to pretty play a pretty damn good game of war. But the aspect of intelligence that threatens us with AI is our complexity, our kind of fuzziness of value, the fact that you cannot assign a number to how good this experience is right now. You know, the fact that you can't put in a linear order how good each movie is, how good each meal is, how good each friend is. But the machines want to. Climate change. This is a polar bear drifting on the last remaining bit of an iceberg, I think. It's like climate change is a threat to us. It's a threat because it threatens our food supply and, you know, perhaps the models are worse than we fear. Perhaps we'll all melt or drown or starve. I include climate change because I think it illustrates what I it illustrates perfectly what I was getting at with my time point. That we don't think in the long term generally. You know, uh, how much does do our politicians actually value the lives of our grandchildren or potential grandchildren? Judging by their actions. You know, what effective policies have they put in place to ensure that we don't get bit by climate change? And if this applies to climate change, it applies to everything else. It applies to AI. You know, you make a policy against AI and you're a Luddite. Or you're, you know, I mean, politicians don't understand technology anyway, so maybe they should steer clear, but it's kind of worrying. Climate change, the case of climate change shows that we really cannot think about our future rationally. And I include myself in that. Nanotechnology. I'm in your grave goo, consuming all your atoms. So for those of you who don't know, grave goo is an imagined scenario where nanobots start to replicate and they consume everything in their path to build more and more copies of themselves, whose sole purpose is to consume everything in their path to build more copies and so on. But, I mean, there's a reason I chose this macro form of production risk. I don't consider it particularly likely. What I do consider likely, though, is kind of the nanotechnology serving the part of a second industrial revolution with the attendant problems of pollution and weapons development. Imagine what kind of horrible weapons you can devise when you can engineer at the molecular level. Speaking of the molecular level, pandemics, viruses, 
biological weapons. So roughly speaking, these risks fall into two kinds. Man-made and natural. So the most common uh, natural pandemic we're aware of is bird flu. You know, uh, a lethal strain of flu develops among the bird population. And that strain learns how to transmit itself to humans. This is terrifying because, you know, when was the last time we actually had to deal with a pandemic where people would die by the millions from disease? I mean, there's AIDS, aren't you? But the thing about AIDS is that it's transmitted sexually or, you know, through fluid contact. Flu is transmitted through the air. You can get flu from, you can get flu from someone just by having them sneeze on you. And, you know, one of the things flu does is make you want to sneeze or cough. But this is also worrying. I mean, supposing we manage to quarantine all the sick people. Chickens can't fly, but pigeons can. And pigeons are just as vulnerable to bird flu. And the thing about pigeons is that while they have been used to great success as messengers, they have yet to master the finer points of international diplomacy. <laughs> In particular, they have yet to master the concept of international borders. They don't care where we erect our borders. And, you know, all it takes is one pigeon flying from an infected nation to your pristine nation, and hey, we've got another source of the virus. So that's man-made. What about biological? What about, uh, sorry, that's nature. What about man-made? Well, I'm almost scared to go into detail about the man-made stuff. I'll relay a fact to you, though. The Treaty Against Biological Weapons doesn't have the same mechanism for enforcement that the Treaty Against Nuclear Proliferation does. Any rogue cell can kind of set up a bio lab, can engineer a virus, and how are we going to tell? You know, it's not like it's not like they're buying uranium or some kind of rare and dangerous chemical that we can tightly control and monitor and inspect. And it's not like bio labs, labs have to be particularly big. So. Biological weapons are kind of a new uh, deal. I mean, it's a kind of game changer, right? They're the poor man's nuke. When you want to destroy the world, but you don't have the resources to procure uranium, and you don't want to get inspect be inspected. So another biological problem. So, as terrifying as this image is, I do not consider Robert Patterson with a horde of zombie babies to be a serious existential risk. What I do consider to be a serious existential risk, though, is overpopulation. In particular, devouring all our resources. You know, all our food, all our iron, you know, all our oil, say, and we consume and we consume so much that by the end we don't have enough to spread across the galaxy and we kind of die with a whimper as we slowly starve to death. And maybe not literally, but perhaps civil and perhaps technologically. You know, if we have no cheap source of energy, if we have no cheap source of material, then what do we do? Could we have an industrial revolution without coal or oil? Tyranny. So this man, Edward Snowden, revealed to us that the NSA is collecting our personal data and storing it. They're collecting our email messages, 
our Facebook messages, more or less all our online activity. And they are searching it for signs of terrorism. Well, this is a noble goal, especially given my remarks about bioterrorism, right? What my worry is, though, is that this is another kind of existential risk the risk of humanity falling into a perpetual state of tyranny. No, a 1984 style, where there is no progress possible because we get held back by the grip of a tyrant. I mean, I don't know, totalitarian regimes don't seem to me the, to be the kind of regimes that encourage progress. Luckily, we kind of have a any solution for this, although it's slightly worrying because the movers and shakers don't seem to endorse it. The solution is to, you know, let there be lots of different nations. There's no, there's no better cure for tyranny than seeing what a, a more free nation does and how much more they prosper. Finally, asteroid impact. So, more or less the, the problems I've discussed until now are problems kind of of our own manufacture. I mean, maybe avian flu isn't, but we know how to deal with avian flu. We monitor the birds, and if they show signs of having a lethal strain, we shoot them. Or we quarantine them, depending on how humane you are. This is a fireball from the sky. This is a real picture, by the way. This happened uh, last year in Russia. Now, there are objects a thousand times the size of this one. Imagine one of them here. Imagine you're in that scenario. Imagine that, you know, our radio waves have discovered that an asteroid the size of uh, Mercury is headed for Earth. And we have six months to prepare to try and deflect it, or stop it, or prevent us all from dying, and prevent the smiling faces from disappearing. What would you do? Maybe you just count your last days and say, well, we had a good run. I rather like the example of this little girl there. <laughs> and, you know, maybe we can pull our resources and buy her a bigger fat. <laughs> and the... I mean, this is kind of part of my overall point, though, that the risks I've discussed are gloomy, and they're shockingly plausible, at least to me. But I think we can do things about them. I'm a techno-optimist, to use Andrew's language. Um, for the case of nuclear war, well, we just don't use the weapons. Uh, Maybe that's a little clear. For the case of AI, we be aware that our values may differ from our machines. And, you know, we take that into account. We don't trust our machines with everything. And we do a lot of moral, philosophical work to try and get our values in a form that the engineers can take and program more easily. I mean, if we actually knew what we wanted, wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, forget about machines. We'd just be more active. We'd get more stuff done. You know, perhaps in each crisis there is an opportunity. In the case of climate change, well, we know what we have to do there. We just lack the political will. You know, we need more. We need more little girls getting, picking up bats and passing legislation that, you know, gives us a carbon tax. And so on. I'm sure you can devise some of 
your own solutions for some of the other problems I've discussed. In the case of, uh, you know, pandemics, for instance, the trick is surveillance and greater international cooperation for the problem of, new, of biological weapons. And we can do that. And in the case of tyranny, we know the solution. Have a variety of nations. So here's this guy. This is our saviour. Well, this is Lord Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal. He takes these issues very, very seriously and he's set up an organisation, the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk, to try and deal with this, these issues. And one, draw public awareness to them, like I'm doing with this talk, and two, try and, and devise strategies to fight them, to reduce the risk. I mean, I always get in trouble because, as Adam said, I study mathematics and I tend to let my mathematical brain run away with me. But if I may beg your indulgence, I'd like to do one bit of arithmetic. Let's say that we can quantify how bad an existential risk occurring would be. Let's say it has negative a trillion points. Uh, for reference, let's say that getting a slice of cake has three points, or five points. So we'd have to consume about uh, 200 billion cakes in order to have the same amount of joy that preventing an existential risk would have. <laughs> so suppose we reduce the percentage chance of an existential risk from, say, 10% to 9%, or from 2% to 1%. Well, that's kind of the equivalent of eating a billion cakes, in a good way. You know, this is an un unbelievable amount of goodness that we've done. Because this goodness is multiplied not only for our current generation, not only are we more safe, but all of our descendants are more safe. Because, you know, the thing about our descendants is that they are under threat, not, not just from risks in their time, but also from risks and hours. So good job, Martin Rees. Here's another interesting uh, solution <coughs> I've heard proposed. I'm not advocating this, but I would like to bring it up for discussion. Moral enhancement. This is an idea uh, devised by Julian Savalescu. The idea is that human morality is to a certain extent malleable. That we can do it, that we can educate our children. That we can take certain drugs to make us kinder. Perhaps we can even tinker at the gene level and remove genes for sociopathy or impulsiveness or you know, staggering short-sighted greed. And perhaps if we do these things, at less risk of making a very stupid decision and killing us and all our descendants. I mean, that's a thought. Perhaps, we'll, perhaps we won't know what we're doing and make ourselves more impulsive by mistake. And here's another idea. This is kind of the pessimist's approach. Spread out. At the moment, we have a single point of failure, Earth. If we say, you know, in say, if in say 200 years, <laughs> we uh, have a colony on Mars, then supposing nuclear war does erupt on Earth, supposing the Earth's climate goes to hell, supposing the Earth is besieged by a swarm of different flu viri and, uh, you know, biological weapons and so on. Even if the Earth explodes, as in my first slide, at least we'll have Mars. At least we can rebuild. At least we can rebuild. At least we've turned a existential risk into a mere catastrophic risk.
So here are some organizations who have had thoughts similar to these. One is the Lifebed Foundation, who I believe Adam is a member of. Uh, what they do is they identify these various risks, such as nanotechnology and so on, and they come up with ways to thwart them. They come up with plans for a baseball bat, if you like. And they have drives that run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The Future of Humanities Institute. The term existential risk was coined by the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom, who works for the Future of Humanity Institute. And they've published a lot more papers on existential risk, including a book, Global Catastrophic Risks, which goes into detail, much more detail than I've been able to give in this talk about the various types of existential risks and perhaps some solutions for preventing them or reducing them, I should say. We can't prevent risks, we can only reduce the risks. The World Economic Forum, well, this is, goes back to my line about the creditors. These are some incredibly rich and powerful economists who meet each year in Sweden uh, to discuss the globe. And each year they come up with a report, Global Risks, with thinking similar along the lines. Uh, one risk that they have included, which I haven't, is a financial collapse. Economists tend to care about that sort of thing, I think. So, the World Economic Forum. And similarly, there's the International Risk Governance Council, whose job is to <coughs> govern global <coughs> risks or come up with recommendations for how risks may be governed. And finally, there's Martin Rees's The Centre for Study of Existential Risk. So we've got both Oxford and Cambridge cooperating in this, so it must be important, right? Uh, here's some further reading from the Global Risk Report, published by the World Economic Forum, Bostrom's original paper, Existential Risks, and Global Catastrophic Risks, a book. Are there any questions? Uh, is there a particular reason why you left um, Supervolcano Corruption off of it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I think it's because I don't know enough geology to do it justice, and I'm not, and I can't quite be sure whether it's an existential risk or just a catastrophic risk. Um, would an eruption of Yellowstone wipe out all life on Earth or wipe out, say, would it kill us in Australia? I don't know. It would kill the Americans, sure. I don't know. Forgive me for being blasé about the Americans. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, develop this argument a little bit. Um, so, the argument seems to me to run along the following lines. Say I'm a mad dictator of a tyrant nation. What kind of that But <laughs> say I am. Um, what's the number one thing that's going to cause discontent in my uh, subjects and my civil servants. Well, kind of looking at the other nations and seeing how much better they're doing. But if my nation is the only nation on earth, I don't have to worry about that. Therefore, we want a kind of uh, redundancy. Even if one nation turns tyrannical, the example of the other nations can kind of correct, put that nation back on the right path. The same way that Germany has been put on the right path now. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, James. Yeah, I wanted to explore the distinction between um, existential risk and global catastrophic risk, because at least to me it seems that many, perhaps all of your examples, seem more to be potential global catastrophic risks. Um, so I guess the question would be, how could you distinguish, like what would the basis be? 
But to give one example of what I mean, mm. you cite the example of pandemics, for example. Yeah. But even something as horrific as the Black Death didn't lead to at no such a kind of big girl we didn't have any medical technology really. Mm. Didn't lead to the extinction of humanity. So it seems there that arguably it's not going to be an existential risk, at least in most cases. But you know, that, that's just an example. So how would you how would you balance that? Like how would you look at what's an existential risk model? Well I do agree that the line is kind of fuzzy. You know, uh, it's a bit like the you know, there's these Greek stories where, you know, some someone hears a prophecy and he resolves to kill everyone in a certain, uh, everybody in a certain family, but, you know, the son escapes and rises uh, back from the dead and takes revenge on the original king. Um, so these are, it is a fuzzy issue, I agree. Um, what merited my inclusion was that I could visualize a scenario in which complete existential elimination, you know, where complete oblivion occurs. And in the case of pandemics, you know, that's just we all go with extinction disease. Which seems possible, if not with, if not with precedent. Dave? Just follow up on Cody's point about Petra's question. How do you see the rise of these big trading blocks like the EU and NAFTA and so forth that seem, we seem to be going in the opposite direction of uh, individual sovereign states and uh, things seem to be uh, coalescing into one amorphous um, <coughs> state, world state. It is a worry. So David asked me about the rise of trading blocks like the EU and perhaps uh, NAFTA. Uh, to be honest, I feel about these kind of the same way that I feel about AI. The, the values of corporations mostly align with ours, but don't completely overlap. And if we give corporations too much power, then perhaps they'll make decisions that we don't agree with. Like the whole uh, copyright thing. Does anyone here agree with uh, not being able to uh, watch Mickey Mouse from Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 1940s? Or watch any cartoon from the 1940s? Because of Mickey Mouse? Yeah. But yeah, it is a real concern. Um, perhaps economic sovereignty is something we'll have to pursue as well. significant existential risks will it be black swans in the sense that we, we actually can't predict them coming um, and the, the risks that we can predict we can actually fairly effectively address. That's a good point. The, so the complaint is here that I missed out on a slide. <laughs> the slide of perhaps the gigantic question mark representing the unknown unknowns. You know, because it would really suck. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we developed a beautiful pol policy, we had complete nuclear disarmament, you know, wonderful medical technology, um, you know, we wiped out disease, we wiped out, you know, we solved our AI problems, our economic problems, we had a robust liberal society and economy. And we do all this and we monitor the asteroids and we have a fairly effective asteroid defense program. And then we get invaded by aliens, say. And they eat all our flesh and so much for the human species. Uh, I think you're right. I think this was an omission on my part. In way of partial justification, I would say that there's not really that much we can do about the unknown <laughs> unknowns. Uh, we should be aware of it. Though. We should realize that our policies can never be universal. There will always be some risk, and we should always seek new seek new threats so we can curb it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a kind of. Just 
funny thing about us is the planet is 4 billion years old. How do we, what about time? How long, are we, how long do we expand? Are we going to go another 8 billion years in species? 20 billion? 25 billion? I like that answer. Um, I mean, it's a kind of, I'm kind of reminded of the joke. Uh, I plan to be immortal, and so far, so good. <laughs> and I really do want the human species to be immortal, or at least to have this kind of continuity of value and agency. Like, even if we, we will probably transform radically. We, you know, perhaps in 10 billion, perhaps in 2 billion years, we will no longer be bipedal, for instance. But I kind of want the human value, the, the human values and the human spirit to live on, whatever that might mean in practice. If I knew what that, if anyone knows what that means, please tell me, because then I can program an AI to uh, bring it about. Isn't that called religion? Sorry? Isn't that religion? Is the human spirit religion? Um, well, perhaps. Uh, it, it would seem to imply that atheists aren't human, though, which... <laughs> well, I mean, if the human spirit is religion, then people who lack religion therefore lack the human spirit. We have brains, no spirits. Yeah. Atheists <laughs> think that no one has spirits. <laughs> but if you want to talk about life after death, I think you're talking about religion. Uh, I'm not talking about life after death. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, you know, our traditions, our uh, values, uh, continuing to shape the world. And that's not life. That's kind of. Yeah. It, it's kind of. It's. So you were talking about immortality. Yeah, well, and civilization, like any biological organism, has a definite lifespan. We just don't know when it ends. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think we. I think there is a kind of immortality that lasts after civilizational collapse. For example, um, say the Greek mathematics. Like Greek civilization is gone, but I think Greek mathematics will survive. I hope for at least another thousand years. I think we could um, survive as a culture in a, a multi-culture of, of alien, you know, galactic aliens who are all um, incredibly alien, sorry, incredibly a, a advanced sort of things. So that every question that we've ever asked, scientific, technological, philosophical, spiritual, has already asked, been asked a thousand times before, and where we have to confront the fact that we're incredibly. Uh, Insular, we have an insular view and uh, don't see the, um, the, the there's a vastly uh, huge uh, universe of uh, possibilities of spirituality and things that we can't even conceive of. Could human culture, please tell me if this is a fair summary, could human culture survive the shock that would occur when we encounter an alien race that is superior to us and also? Alien races. Alien races, sorry. Alien races which are vastly superior to us and also vastly alien to us. Uh, I don't know, perhaps that's a good justification for the Prime Directive. Uh, you know, look but don't touch. Uh, the closest historical precedent I can think of is when one, say, technologically inferior civilization comes into contact with another civilization, and looking at that, the results don't tend to be pretty. Don't you think that if they're technologically superior, they probably been and gone and said, oh, they're too dumb to be bothered with? It's like we do with the So yeah, why, why should advanced aliens care about us at all? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I don't know, perhaps for the same reason we care about ants or butterflies. Uh, perhaps we have some resource that they enjoy or wish to consume. I don't know.
Okay. Well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.